It's Rexy's musical podcast. Since 1978, Dire Straits released only six studio albums, plus three live albums and three compilations. The band have sold more than 100 million albums around the world. That puts Dire Straits slightly ahead of people like David Bowie or Bob Dylan or bands like Genesis or the Beach Boys and a lot of others. It's almost impossible to imagine, but when it comes to certified sales, it's absolutely true. And if you're old enough to remember the 1980s, then you're probably old enough to remember the 1985 behemoth Brothers in Arms, which was not only their biggest selling album, it catapulted the band into one of the biggest drawing live bands in the world. In fact, Dire Straits was supposed to become the headlining band at Live Aid later that year, but scheduling issues made that impossible. Nevertheless, between sales, their quick association with MTV, their relentless touring schedule for every album, the greatness of Dire Straits would be undeniable with four Grammy Awards and lots of accolades along the way. And so it made complete sense that in 2018, they would be inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. While guitar singer-songwriter Mark Knopfler would be the focus of the band's outrageous success, bass player John Ilsley would be the only other original member of the band to play on every tour and on every album. From their debut single, Sultan's a Swing, to their final shows together in 1995, John Ilsley has been the backbone of one of the most important bands in history. John has just published his memoirs entitled My Life in Dire Straits. It's a beautifully written book that takes you from his childhood, his discovery of music, to his relationship with Mark and his brother David. It's a detailed account of their astonishing rise to fame and their decision to finally break up the band for good in the mid-1990s. This is my conversation with John Ilsley from Dire Straits on Baxi's Musical Podcast. How you doing, John? I'm good, thank you. How are you? Very good. Very nice to see you. Whereabouts are you? Uh, Massachusetts, Springfield, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. Okay, so you've got snow there as well. Uh, we had we had a little bit of a dusting, and thankfully nothing too uh, too great because I'm not I am not ready for snow yet. That's for sure. I don't think any of us are, but uh, we had a bit this morning down even in England. Um, it's been very very cold here. It's just like. Um, just as everybody's talking about global warming, we get a really serious cold snap. <laughs> it's always the case. It's always the case. So I, uh, I, I finished the book this weekend, and, um, and I absolutely loved it. And I, I, the great thing about these interviews that I've been doing is it, it kind of forces me to, to, to really do this huge, deep dive. It's like I'm studying for finals in college all, <laughs> all over again. <laughs> uh, you're reading the book and, and, and watching other you know, videos of, of interviews that you've done. But one of the things that, that I did do is I really dove back into all of the Dire Straits records. And, you know, I mean, these are records that I've been listening to since 1978, 79, through all, through all of high school. And, and the thing that I always appreciated and, and, and the book kind of, I, I think in a, in a way kind of confirms my feeling about this is unlike a lot of the bands at the time, which were not necessarily involved in a lot of subtlety, you guys were taking a very subtle approach to the music and there was restraint and, and dynamics in a way that most bands coming out of England in 1978 had wanted nothing to do with. But I think that's what separated you guys from, from, from everybody else. Well, I think you've sort of put your finger on it, really. I, I, the band never really tried to associate itself with any kind of uh, trend or any fashion of music or style or whatever. I mean, very much it just had its own style right from the beginning. And I think that um, that's what made it kind of stand out, I suppose, uh, when everybody else was following a particular trend. For instance, with the, with the whole punk and the new wave thing that was going on, you know, people, everybody, of course, thought with a name like Dire Straits, we were some glorified punk band. <laughs> um, but, <laughs> so they were a bit disappointed, maybe. But uh, I think that, that you know, sometimes um, you just have to stick to your stick to the way you play music, and I, I pretty much we've pretty much done that right from the word go. And I, you make a, a very valid point. Um, I think style is everything, really. Your own your own way of doing things is everything. 
But I also think there's a there was a level of musicianship, even you know, out of the gate with the first record, that that mm-hmm. most bands could not compete with. Not that every band in, in the punk and 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 new wave genre, if you want to call it that, couldn't play their instruments. But the music they were playing was almost showing that they were trying not to sound like they were great, uh, great musicians. And and you guys had no fear about that. It was it was very clear from the very from the very moment you hear you know, Mark Knopfler playing guitar, you realize, OK, this guy at the very least, rest, never mind the rest of the band, this guy at the very least was something very different and very special. Well, uh, you've just said what I was just about to say, that, that when I first heard him play, I thought, OK, I've played with a few guitarists in my time, but um, this is different yeah. um, in, a, in a fairly major way. And it, and, and, it, and it just it reminded me of all those different kinds of records that I used to listen to. And somehow they put a lot of the feel of, of those records into his own particular style. So that set that sent the sort of uh, benchmark, if you like, for the rest of us. And um, because none of us were professional musicians at all. And the only one, a professional musician, if you can call it that, was Pick Withers, right. the drummer, um, who came with a lot of um, credibility. And I learned a lot from Pick very quickly. Uh, I mean, I'd played with a lot in a lot of bands up until this particular point, but nothing that was... Um, didn't I mean this felt like it was going to go somewhere pretty much straight away, um, despite the fact that we were playing in pl- uh, clubs and pubs around London, and you know getting very little money and living on sort of you know French fries and burgers and stuff and a, and a couple of couple of pints a day, but I don't know I I never really thought about the level of musicianship. It's just the it's just, that's just the way that we played when we played together. It's just. It just fell into that particular shape, if yeah. I can put it that way. Guided very much by the guitar uh, approach to the guitar, especially on this first record. You know, it, it, in the uh, in the forward that he wrote uh, for the book, Mark uh, Knopfler talks about how thank goodness you guys didn't approach this when you were teenagers. That you were you had a little maturity under under your belt. Yeah. You you were you know I think late twenties uh, by the yeah. time the band started, and 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 I. And that resonates, you know, pretty pretty strongly when you, when I hear the music, and especially, you know, when you also talk about, you know, the idea of like negotiating contracts, you know, especially <laughs> on, you know, you hear all the time all these bands, you know, they're you know nineteen twenty years old, they don't know anything other than the fact that, you know, here's Richard Branson across from them in a table and he's waving, you know, this indentured servitude in front of them. <laughs> Yes, but exactly. but you guys were not necessarily enticed by that and and really probably got in hindsight really a, a pretty remarkable contract uh, right away you just, you just don't hear those kinds of stories where you know there's not bitter and hostility over the contract you wind up signing well, yes i mean you 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 you've you've said a lot of things there i don't know how to sort of paraphrase that into an answer <laughs> i mean um I think that being a bit older um, certainly helped. Um, I'm not sure it was the final answer, but it certainly helped to sort of think about things a bit more deeply before we said yes. And we had a lot of decision making to to uh, to, to to do uh, in a very short period of time, because things you know things happened quite quickly. I mean, one of the reasons why I wrote this book was because. Um, even for myself, I needed to sort of go back and just see how how one's life moved from one situation to the next. And, you know, not just musically, but uh, philosophically and uh, mentally uh, and, and how you dealt with situations and why you took a particular course in life. Because I think it's very, very important for anybody uh, listening to this or listening to uh, any other b- body's story your story is is yours and it's nobody else's and so i wanted to try and get this story down the way that i remembered it and i'm, I'm and i'm i'm damn sure that i'm going to get people saying actually it wasn't <laughs> like that at all you know it was like this and i'm going to say, I say well it's my that's what i remember and if it's different well we might do it in the reprint or we might not we might just leave it but um i think it's very important to understand why you end up in particular places in life i mean why are you doing what you're doing you know there's a series of events that have happened that 
you probably made happen and other people made happen and why why you end up in a in a in a in a situation which you go well how did i get here i mean what's going on why am i playing in front of 60,000 people in a in a big stadium when five ten years ago i was sitting in a pub in deptford wondering how i was actually going to pay the rent <laughs> you know so and, and and that's you know that's that's why i think it's it was worth putting it down because it's actually quite an interesting uh the band had quite an interesting history i think um apart from his musical history i think from a from a personal point of view and and with mark too and 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 with david although david wasn't there for very long but you know you need to what you need to know how these things fit together in your life in order to make sense of it in order to find out why you are where you are now and say so somebody gave me the opportunity to write this book and i i was i was mm, shall i shan't i so I, I I rang Mark up and I said, look, mate, I, I said some crazy person's offered me a publishing deal to write something about the band. And he said, oh, blimey, why do you want to bother doing that? <laughs> <laughs> I said, well, if I don't do it, mate, then nobody else is, you ain't going to do it. Nobody else is going to do it. And I think it's a story worth telling because it's kind of a celebration of what we did. And, and uh, you know, that's if that's answered your question, um, uh, I mean, we did get a good record deal from Phonogram, I must say, yeah. uh, because they they wanted to see the band develop. So that was a big help. It wasn't just a one album deal, you know. One of the interesting parts for me, and I, and I think it's it, part of that is because I mean, I've been in radio for so long, is mm. this the story of the uh, of the original demo that you guys had done. And I listened to it on YouTube, and it, and it's and it's I can I can see why someone might be very excited about something like this, but. The, the story of you, you, you get some inheritance money from a family member who died, you, you record this demo, and then all of a sudden it's like, well, now what do we do? And you, <laughs> you, you get it into the hands of this, this guy on radio. I believe it's it Charlie Gillette. I think I have the, the name. Yeah. And uh, all of a sudden he, he hears it and loves it. And yeah. his effort is what all of a sudden created this huge interest in, in the band. Yeah. And what's fascinating is from that moment on, it's like you go from like zero to a hundred in like what seems like a matter of, of seconds. I mean, I know it was longer than that, but the trajectory after that was, was pretty bracing. Well, it was a roller coaster. That's all I can say. And, you know, and, and, and in some ways, you know, when things are happening so quickly and the landscape is changing all the time, uh, you have to make a lot of decisions. You have to, you have to actually, do a lot of things you never thought you'd have to do and then you needed people to enable to make this thing work as well so you had to get a good team around you and you know we didn't really know anything about the music business as such you know as because as you know the music business is very much different from the music <laughs> and the music was always the key for us but we did it we had a bit of a, a, a lot of stuff happened quite quickly and in order to try and keep up with it uh, we had to learn a lot, you know. It was it was it was quite a it was it was quite a journey, you know. And uh, and and I think David one of, the, one of the reasons I talk about David leaving in in the way I did because he was finding that that quick um, quickness too too much for him. He just it it didn't feel right to him, you know. He saw he said to me one time he said it wasn't supposed to be like this, and I said. <laughs> Well, it is. I mean, what was it? What was it supposed to be like? And he said, "Well, not like this." And I thought, "Well, I don't know where we're going with this conversation because it is what it is." And when things are what they are, you just you either you either go the go with the flow or you get off the train, you know. And the train was running pretty fast. It's very clear the way you describe the uh, the situation with David, and, uh, and, yeah. and even with other members of the band that that you're you're either designed. For this kind of lifestyle yeah, or you're yeah, or you're yeah. not and and it, it, yeah. there's there's no right or wrong like you say in the book everyone has their own way of handling that kind of that kind of pressure and that kind of you know, relentlessness and obviously yeah. it, david is very different than than mark well they're, they're very different characters you're quite right and um you know i i, I, I absolutely you know mark and i absolutely enjoyed the success part of it we we enjoyed that uh, we really enjoyed that sort of that that moment of um, uh, you know when we were able to create something like that 
uh, which is, you know, which go, I'm going to go back to, um, you know, Marx, Marx uh, character in this way, the way that he wrote these songs and the power of these songs that formed the character of the band. And, and I think that David, who also was writing, was feeling a little bit, maybe a little bit, maybe a bit, his nose was put out of joint a bit because he was writing a bit as well. But to my mind, if you've got a really great writer in the band, then stay with that. You know, I was writing songs too, but I wasn't writing songs of the quality that Mark was writing. So it wasn't a question of like, oh, what about me sort of thing? It's like, look, just, you know, if this, if this, guy, if this guy is able to write songs like, you know, Salt to Swing and Romeo and Juliet and, you know, great, fantastic, here we go, you know, and, and then another one comes on the, on, you know, Money for Nothing comes on the track. And so success is a wonderful thing. Uh, if you if you enjoy that process, you know, and not from a power point of view, don't get me wrong, but just from a, an inner feeling of satisfaction. But you, but like you mentioned, Dave is trying to do you know one thing. He's writing his music. He's trying to pl to, to play at, at at this level. But this is not the first situation where brothers have been in a band, and for yeah, whatever yeah. reason, you know, one maybe outshining the other. I mean, I think of you know you know Ray and Dave Davies, or you know John and Tom Fogarty. I mean, these are uh, family relationships that become very strained based upon what they do, who's getting the attention, and I think in in a, in a way, it's it's a very natural human behavior to have Positive. to be rubbed Positive. the wrong way with that yes and and you know on the other hand i was very happy that mark was getting all the attention and <laughs> <laughs> i wasn't getting bothered so much uh, so it it didn't it didn't worry me at all um and uh yes i mean as i say it's like some sort of shakespearean tragedy really in, in some ways i mean uh, I don't know, didn't know what else, how else to put it, apart from the fact that, uh, you know, that that blood that joins you together is different from what's going on in your head. You know, you either you either run with it, you either run with it, or you or you don't run with it. And and uh, and the thing is that you know, for me it was really difficult, Mike, because um, I was friends with both of them. I mean, it was really uh, a tricky one. You know, dead tricky, but I could see it wasn't good for the band. And at that particular time, the band was kind of, dare I say, everything. So that, of course, puts your other family in a separate sort of place as well, which I talk about in the book, which is very difficult to deal with. You've got these two families going on. You've got your band family and you've got your, your loving family with your kids and your girlfriend or wives or whatever. And that's really, that's another difficult thing to deal with. I tried to handle that in the book as best I could, but because it was very difficult for most of us, actually. Like you say, I mean, you know, both of the brothers you're very, very close to, and you've, you know, these are lifelong yeah. friendships. You, you, you see, you know, fractured relationships in bands all the time, but when it comes to family, that's, you know, those are deeper roots than. Yeah, 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 exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. Right. I can, I can, I can see the 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 nuance that you have to you know straddle in order to you exactly. know to be friends with both but then also you're part of a larger entity in dire straits it's it, you can't just walk away and in, and in your case i mean the your, the the greatest success was on its you know around the corner it was still yet to come well yes and of course uh, nobody knew you don't know anything about this kind of stuff until it's happened and you can look back and go oh well of course it was <laughs> you know it was like that and like that um I mean, what I loved about it, to be honest, Mike, was the fact that, you know, we every time we had a new record, it was a really, it was a new project. It wasn't going to go, oh, we're going to make what we did before. You know, we really, we really experimented with, with stuff, you know, to try and keep, A, keep it interesting for us, but also keep it interesting for the people who were, you know, who were fans of the band and go, oh my God, what Telegraph Road, Jesus Christ, what the hell is that? <laughs> you know, I mean... I remember working on that, you know, during the sound checks for on the Making Movies tour and thinking that this, you know, this this song is a this <laughs> this song is something else. I mean, you know, putting that together yeah. and watching Mark and, and Alan Clark sort of interplaying with different ideas. Alan being a wonderful piano player and and Mark saying, you know, oh, what about this? And Alan saying, well, I could do this there. And oh, by the way, John, can you just play a note there? I said, yeah, sure, whatever. And then 
you know, and the drums, yeah, okay. And it was a wonderful sort of, uh, wonderful creative times we had together, which I, you know, I just, I kind of miss that really with, because I do my stuff on my own now and I work with my own guys, but in that situation, it was really unique and very special because everybody was sympathetic to the idea of the band and what it meant, not just for us, but to other people. Well, I, I know, you know, for myself, you know, Dire Straits had always been a part of the music that we listened to. Me, my friends, you know, it was just always present. And then I went away to college in, uh, you know, and by 1985, Brothers in Arms comes out and it's the biggest damn record in the world. And one of the things that was interest, huh? inter oh. interesting to, uh, to go back and, and, and look at was, you know, for Americans, you know, we, you know, we have this tendency to only kind of think of our borders as what the world is, but you know, yeah, yeah. you mentioned how many albums are being sold all over the world and the yeah. cumulative number of what Dire Straits sold is particularly on Brothers in Arms is a staggering number of, of yeah, records. Yeah. I mean, if you look at the list of all the great you know, selling artists of all time, you guys are higher than Bob Dylan or David Bowie. And I mean, the list is remarkable. I, I know for, for me, the first time I heard Money for Nothing, it was like, oh my God, this band came up with that? It was it was phenomenal. Well, can you imagine what I felt like when I heard it? <laughs> I know. I, 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 I can only imagine when you've got a guy who's writing this this music and he progressively gets, I mean, he's always been writing great songs, but as he goes on every album, it's like a stronger batch of, of songs. To hear it for the yeah, very yeah, first yeah. time, as a guy who's got to put a bass part to all, all this stuff, I mean, what is your reaction to, to Mark Knopfler's body of music as, as you're in that moment? Well, I mean, I, I, I have to say I felt very privileged to be part of the, part of the process in putting, the, you know, putting my, my bit into the, into the mix. I mean, to put it bluntly, I mean, uh, we, had a, we, had a, we were fortunate that we had an awful lot of material that was universally, as you, your point you make, is universally kind of accepted. And you're quite right. We do get a bit parochial with the way that we listen to music. Um, I mean, if you go to Germany, for instance, you hear German music. You very, don't hear too much English music, but we were huge in Germany right. for some reason. So it, 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 music sort of knocks the boundaries out, you know, knocks them out. You, 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 and, and if you happen to be in a situation like we were, where the music was feeding into this uh, a global sort of marketplace if you like to want of a better expression and people were enjoying it in in new zealand and australia and south america and israel i mean huge in israel who would have thought i mean for god's sake what's that about uh i don't know what it is it's a universal language music those songs they spoke they spoke very loudly to a lot of different people people who couldn't, couldn't understand english yeah i mean the other day I had this 18-year-old kid from from uh, some city in China, which I can't possibly um, remember the name <laughs> of or even pronounce. And he said, "I've just discovered Dire Straits." He said, "And I'm going to I'm going to learn how to play the guitar." And I thought, "This is a bloke in China. I mean, I mean who would have known that would happen?" Uh, it's one. It's wonderful. I mean, it's a very very powerful media music. It's a joiner. You know, it unites people. I don't know anything else that does that apart from a pandemic. <laughs> yeah, well, thankfully, one's a whole lot more uh, pleasurable than the other. That's that's this for sure. True. You talk a lot in the book about the the pressure of of touring, what that means, you know, physically and and yeah. personally, and you know, and how it affects you know not only you and the people in the band, but also the people at home uh, yeah. who are waiting for you to 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 come back home and. One of the things that that's that I, I you know I've heard before is that when people are on the road for a period of time, and actually there's a great parallel that you wrote early in the book about your father coming home from war, about yeah, yeah. you know you're you're away from home for such a long period of time that it's sometimes hard to understand what it's like to be home after you've been away yeah. for for so long. Yeah. It's actually a really interesting parallel that you that you drew between you and your father's experience. Yeah, good. A very good point, actually. Uh, and the period of adjustment is different for different people. But you know, in the war, you know, they, they and they, 
this is why you know they, they were the my parents were the way they were because of that experience of being separated and then wanting to have a secure and safe safe i use that word you know very liberally because they wanted us all to be safe because they weren't safe for about five or six years it was a very unsafe world then so when he came home they wanted to be safe and it's uh, you know and the parallels with being on the road look you know the difference is of course that i was having a fantastic time and i don't think my father was having such a fantastic <laughs> time being no it doesn't sound like North it african desert you know, <laughs> getting shot at but um so there's a difference there but the trend when you get home you, and you think oh my god have i got a, what is that oh that's the washing up you know ha, can i have a clean where's my clean shirt you know <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, and you know you've got to go to the shops and you've got to go and get some food and you know you i don't know it's the, the adjustments are very very tricky and and uh, you know it was it was difficult to deal with that side of things but of course you know you were having the most incredible time on the road you were in this family you were being looked after properly you were playing to great audiences the the communication between you and the audience was always wonderful so there's nothing not to like about it but you know there's you, there's a price you pay for everything in life and you have to pay a price for your pleasure if you like and i know that sounds kind of rather crude but it's this it is it is the way it is so what do you think it was about you and mark that uh kept you in it for as long as you as you did i mean obviously you know other people around you other members of the band you know, had come and gone at that point and you know some could handle that stress and, and 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 some couldn't but yet you guys were able to to deal with it un, until you know you decided we'd had quite enough what what was it about the two of you that was different it's difficult to analyze friendship isn't it i mean i think we were just a good partnership we we had the same feelings about what we were doing we agreed on pretty much everything that we wanted to try and do i was i was good at some things that he wasn't good at uh, certainly in the early days, um, you know, when we were starting out, I did a lot of the stuff that I, I was able to pass on to other people later on. But I think in some ways, I say this, it's a rather strange thing to say, but I think he felt safe with me because I'm a pretty safe pair of hands. I'm, you know, I, I, I you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not easily flustered, you know, by things. And, uh, you know, so I could I could I could support him and he could support me. And so there was a sort of mutual understanding of, of who we were as people. And we we had a good laugh together, apart from anything else. We and we still do. I mean, we we don't talk about music hardly ever, but we we talk about different kinds of wine now. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's interesting how you, you both seem to arrive at that moment pretty much at the same time that it, it was time to put dire straits to bed like yes. like you had both kind of decided you know what we've taken this for as far as we can possibly take it without either you know becoming uh you know repetitive or uh yeah. or whatever it may be do you feel like at the time and and now that it was the right decision oh yeah no definitely definitely i mean i think we would have probably we would we might have been a bit more damaged if we carried on trying to do and and don't forget there was quite a big gap between brothers and arms and um on every street it was five years maybe yeah and and the hand after the brothers in arms tour finished i i was sort of like wow i think i, I was exhausted then and so was he and <laughs> i know he was doing other projects but and i went off and did a another solo album but you know, generally speaking, it was like, okay, now it's it's my, it's my it's my time, it's me time. And uh, I was quite, as I say in the book, I was quite sort of surprised when he said, "I've got some songs that Dire Straits should do," because he was doing he was doing lots of work with different people, uh, you know, because he's he's called on to do a lot of things and and uh, not just movie scores, but just playing on different people's uh, albums and stuff. And um, you know, so that's how On Every Street came about. And of course, we did the, the Mandela 70th birthday show with Eric Clapton and, you know, playing with him with us. And uh, and I think that he just he sort of thought, well, I, I've got one more Dire Straits album in me. And I knew he I knew his his feelings about the band were uh, even before On Every Street started. He he wanted to just have one more thing with the band. These songs suited the band, but he was he was already thinking about 
the next phase, I think. Sure. I don't think the thing about Mark is he doesn't want to get categorized. And I think the reason the reason why, you know, we, we don't play because as soon as we, he and I start playing together, there's this, oh my God, die straight to kind of come out, you know. <laughs> and so that all the stories start rattling around. Um and uh, you know, we we we're, we're just we're just great buddies now, and yeah. and, that, and it's it's great, you know. And I, and and you know, I did say to him, I, I want you to read this book uh, before I even consider putting it out because it's about you and me. And um, I said, if you if you think it's you think it's not worthy, then you just tell me, and I'll dump it. And he came back and he said, I think it's great. Yeah. I said. If you think it's great, then can you write the forward? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he's been he's been pretty clear over over the years that he doesn't that he's not interested in in a uh, in a reunion or or bringing the, no, the band right. back. But but if Mark were to call you up and say, uh, oh, "Hold on to something firm before you fall out of your chair," but I've got some songs I want to play with you, would as Dire Straits, would you agree to it, or would you be hesitant about it? No, no, I'd agree to it. I'd agree to it. Of course, I would. Yeah, it'd be an absolute pleasure. Do you call of him course. up? You call him up every couple of weeks and say, "Hey, what do you what do you come up with?" <laughs> <laughs> no, we haven't got to that stage yet. You haven't. You haven't. You haven't. No, said... I mean, I, I, I see him probably, you know, if not every fortnight. I, mean, I saw him last week, and uh, I'll probably see him next week doing something or other. I mean, you know, we see each other every now and again. He lives quite close to me, so you know, uh, so that's not difficult. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm open to I'm open to all sorts of suggestions. It's 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 highly unlikely, and I'm not anticipating it in the slightest. I'd be very surprised. Um, but you know, I mean, he you know he's played on a few things of mine over the years, and uh, you know, I I think I just it's just a nice relationship, and he you know he's he's endlessly creative, and he doesn't want to get stuck somewhere. He doesn't want to you know he's he's. He's had that dire straits thing on his head, and he, you know, he wants to be Mark Knopfler now. Yeah, you know, I can understand that, and I've heard that from from other people that you know are, are forever pigeonholed by by the label. You know, I'm I'm always going to be yeah. seen as a member of this, and I can't really shake being away from this. I mean, there are very few people that that have been able to do it. Mark is one of those that that has, but. But it's but it's it's a it's it's a rarefied company that can no, claim it that. Is. I mean, if you think, I mean, you could probably count on one hand the amount of uh, individuals who've come out of a successful band and been, you know, pretty damn successful. I mean, Sting was one from the Police. Uh, uh, okay, Mark was one. Um, okay, let's have to keep thinking. <laughs> we'll be here all day suppose, trying to remember another name. I suppose uh, you know. Uh, yeah, David Gilmore and and uh, Roger Roger Waters has been. And now I'm thinking. Now I'm thinking. I don't know. Yeah, I can't, I, I can't. it's very it's a very small group. It's difficult. It's difficult. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, uh, well, you know, I'm I'm very you know, if I go out playing, I mean, I make it quite clear who I am and who you know my heritage. I'm not ashamed of that at all. You know, and it get if it gets people to come and see me and, hit, and listen to my stuff, then I'm I'm very happy for to happen. I'm not at all shy about using it. I, I can't blame you. For, I can't blame you for that. Absolutely. <laughs> the uh, The name of the book is "My Life in Dire Straits." It is a It is a really wonderful uh, memoir of your of your career and your friendships and your family and uh, and everything else. And I really I really did enjoy it quite a lot. So thank you very much. I appreciate thank the you time. Very much, nice to meet you. Okay, no problem. Okay. Once again, the name of the book is "My Life in Dire Straits" by John Ilsley. If you like the podcast, feel free to like it, share it, review it, tell all your friends about it. You can email me at fax at rock102.com. I'd love to know what you think and certainly appreciate the feedback. And thanks again for listening to Baxi's Musical Podcast.